The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I am the host for this podcast. My husband, Steve Siegel, is the producer of the podcast. This is episode number 330. And before I tell you about today's interview, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and please give us a five-star rating. That way, when people are searching for help with addiction for themselves or loved ones, they find our podcast, and that's our whole purpose, is to provide hope and to let people know that help is available. So if you could also check out our YouTube channel, subscribe. Ring the bell so you get notified and give us a thumbs up on our videos again, so that when someone looks, Google reaches out and finds us. Thank you in advance for doing that. So today's episode is an interview with a gentleman that we've interviewed before, but we feel that he brings a lot to the table in terms of investigation into this whole area. So here's the description of him. A merciless pit bull of an investigator is what the Chicago Tribune said about Gerald Posner, a former attorney turned investigative journalist and author. He's written 13 acclaimed books, including New York Times hardcover nonfiction bestsellers, Case Closed, Case, sorry, Case Closed, Why America Slept, and God's Bankers. Posner was a finalist for the Pulitzer in history for Case Closed. He has also written dozens of articles and opinion pieces for leading national magazines and newspapers, and is currently a contributor to Forbes, as well as reporting on a wide variety of topics. In Just the Facts, his substack. His latest book, Pharma, Greed, Lies, and the Poisoning of America, published in 2020, won the Florida Best General Nonfiction Award and was shortlisted for Best Business Book by the Society for Advancing Business Editing and Writing. The New York Times said Pharma was, quote, a withering and encyclopedic indictment of a drug industry that often seems to prioritize profits over patients. It reads like a pharmaceutical version of cops and robbers, end quote. Gerald's wife, author Patricia Posner, works with him on all of his projects and, I might add, is an author in her own right. So without further ado, let's talk again to Gerald Posner. Gerald Posner, thank you so much for being on the podcast again today. I always love it when we talk. I just, um, yeah. I love it when we talk. We don't necessarily talk about uh, birthday parties and cakes. We talk about perhaps heavier subjects, but they're subjects that need to be talked about. And we just have, um, Steve and I both have a huge amount of respect for you and Trisha for the work that you guys do. Um, it's, uh, it's just huge in terms of what is needed today in the area of addiction. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you very much for having me uh, back, uh, Joni. Uh, you know, what you do on the Addiction Podcast, both in individual stories of people who have gotten past their addictions and have changed their lives around, and in terms of policy from DEA agents to, to people at the border to journalists like myself, you're covering this from every possible angle. And so it's always great to be back with you to talk about it. Thank you so much. Gerald, for the people who are not familiar with you, and I did give um, the bio that was sent to me, but tell a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and how you got involved in investigative reporting, and specifically pharma, how you got involved in that. Uh, You know, so pharma was my last book of 13 books. It came out right at the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020. It's an 800 page history of the American drug industry. And uh, it it covers a lot. The the spine, what I call the narrative spine that stays through the story in essence is the Sackler family before they had OxyContin um, and after they had OxyContin and the the opioid epidemic. And that is probably the the heart of the book in many ways as it tells that story through there. Um, I've uh, done books on a lot of different subjects together with uh, my wife, Tricia, uh, everything from Nazi war criminals to to Chinese gangs in the heroin business to political assassinations. In another life, I was a lawyer uh, and uh, the uh, had done a pro bono lawsuit for some twins who had been experimented on it at Auschwitz, the Nazi concentration camp. And I remember that's what that. that. I remember that. Yes. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. 
Yeah. Yeah, No, no, no. That's what got me. Uh, The lawsuit failed. We were thrown out of federal court. We couldn't get them any extra compensation. Ended up turning that into the first book, a biography of the angel of death uh, in 1986. And some of the proceeds then went back to the twins. Uh, And that was when I pretty much decided to leave the law and keep writing. Trisha was on the adventure with me. And actually, it was in 1990, the end of 1989, so three years after that book came out, that I first wrote about fentanyl. Uh, Hard to imagine. I mean, I can't believe we're talking 32 years ago now. Um, It was an article. It was in research that I did. I found out from the DEA agents that I dealt with in doing a book in 1988 called Warlords of Crime about the heroin business. I had come back from South America and said to Tricia, by the way, I met these Corsicans uh, who had fled France because they were involved in the heroin trade. They're fugitives in Paraguay. And they said the heroin business used to be a great business, quote unquote, but it's lost its honor because it's been taken over by the Chinese. I said, Tricia, evidently Chinese gangs have taken over the heroin business. You want to look into that? I knew I married the, the right woman. She said, sure. <laughs> we went to Southeast Asia and the Golden Triangle for six months and put that story together. We met a lot of DEA agents and, uh, and Hong Kong police and narcos in, in uh, Thailand. Some of those DEA agents said, by the way, we have a new problem coming up. It's synthetic drugs. We're not going to have to worry one day about which ship in a port is hiding the heroin that's been processed in a lab from poppies in Southeast Asia or how much cannabis is grown and then being sent in bales and being disguised. And the same thing with cocaine, because we're getting to the point where they're able to make it in a laboratory anywhere. They don't have to worry about good weather for crops and importation and fentanyl was put on my radar. I went out at the time. I had a story that said from DEA agents why they thought this was the next great threat. New York Times, Rolling Stone, Mother Jones, uh, Vanity Fair, New Yorker, everybody said, nope, ah, that's just a scare story about something. And it ended up, in, I went to Playboy, which then wow. used to publish uh, real uh, long stories, believe it or not, back in the day. They said no. It ended up in Penthouse, Playboy's wow. competitor. So that's where the story in 1990 was published about fentanyl because no one in the mainstream press thought it was any interest. I have it reprinted on my Substack uh, so that anybody can go there and look at the original in full from that period. And if you look at it now, it's, it, it's pressing it, not because I knew we'd be here today. I had yeah. no idea, yeah. but the, the warnings they were giving, and then there's a gap of 15 years really in which you don't see much about fentanyl at all. Right. It wasn't as all of a sudden, a few years later, people started to write about it. So here's this matter that's now come back. If you had said to me in 1990, by the way, do you think one day 100,000 Americans a year are going to be dying of opioids and 70% of those will be from fentanyl and we'll have more fentanyl being caught to kill Americans five times over just in what's being seized? I'd say, no, it couldn't be. That's like a dystopian nightmare. But yeah. it is where we yeah. are, unfortunately. Yeah. How can people find that article? Because all of a sudden I'm going, I want to read the article. Um, so if they go to Substack, um, I have a Substack called Just the Facts by Gerald Posner. And in uh, if you just click on my Substack, there's a list of the 20 or 25 different articles I've done. And there's the one on fentanyl, probably somewhere somewhere, you know, on that board right there. And I'll also send a link out. Uh, anybody that writes to you, uh, we can get it afterwards as well. It's a it, it's a piece today that it, you would think, if you read it, and that you were listening to DEA. I have DEA officers on the record and officials in Washington at the time raising uh, sort of the you know a warning flag about it, and the way that the mainstream periodicals had said no to it, they thought it was just an effort by the DEA to get more money, to get a bigger budget. They said, oh, this is an effort by the the DEA to say, we have a new scientific drug out here that's going to cause problems for us. And what are we going to do about it? And they were also talking, by the way, in this article about methamphetamine, about the ability to do synthetic versions that would replace cocaine, um, easier things and stimulants and everything else. So the concern was the synthetic market, but the heart of it was fentanyl. The, uh, and it shows you how long fentanyl has been around uh, the, uh, in that sense. And then in 
recently I've followed up. So, you know, fentanyl has always been a thread there. I've done pharma, which is on the, on the prescription end of the market. Sometimes. The hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 866-989-4499 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one hour consultation with Bobby. A couple of months ago, also on Substack, I returned to do a story about gridlock in the in uh, the fentanyl war. And what I meant by that, people can find it also there on Substack. Uh, it's talking about the fact, Joni, think about this. We're here, you know it so well, you cover this all the time. Fentanyl is leaving a trail of death and destruction in America, as OxyContin did, but even worse in the sense that we can't go after doctors who overprescribe. We're looking exactly. for deeper. Yeah, you get it. It's, it's completely unchecked. Now, you would think, I would think, that we could get bipartisan agreement in Washington oh. on moving forward on it. So something simple. Let's not yeah. take the everything. The simple thing for me is safe. This, this sort of safety act that's been presented in Congress. So here's the idea. This is why I wrote about it, because it just had me infuriated. The There are fentanyl analogs and analog is you have fentanyl that's gone through the process of the dea they've tested it they've had in chemists come in they have they, they break down the chemical structure they put it on the controlled substance list they are enforcing the law they arrest somebody they can prosecute them an analog is a chemical sort of variation of the underlying fentanyl sometimes as small as literally it can be a, a single you know you're talking about a, changing a single feature on, on the chemical structure and it's right. chemically different. Right. Sometimes it makes it stronger. That's what the chemists are trying to do. Right. And they do that occasionally. Uh, and uh, we, we've seen that. But when they do that, it means that technically it's not on the controlled substance list. So you can't prosecute it. Now, that seems insane. I understand that. Trump in 2018 convinced China, the Trump administration, to put four major fentanyl analogs on their banned list. So China went against those. And the DEA then got a rule passed that said we cover all fentanyl analogs. Fantastic, end of subject. Except that authority expired in 2020 for the DEA. So now what Congress has done, every time it's come up six month extensions, they've extended it since then. The point of my article is, why can't we get a bipartisan agreement to permanently pass the fentanyl analog prohibition so that it's there and we know we don't have to do this jumping around game with the chemists and the chemicals. And that's because when it comes up before Congress now, the Democratic Senate only wants to pass it, they're willing to, if it's included as part of $10.5 billion that will go to harm reduction and to education and to furthering treatment so that people can get off of their addictions. That's an admirable goal. We need a lot more funding in that area, I understand. But the two shouldn't be tied together. Exactly. So, and this is where I just am infuriated that the mainstream media and others aren't on it more because this should be low-hanging fruit. Uh, let's just get it past Democrats and Republicans. Let's get it done. Yep, I agree with you. And, you know, um, it, what this makes me think of is I watched a hearing and um, I apologize, I'm bad with names, but we had a fellow who used to work at the DEA and he's very passionate about this whole fentanyl um, issue. And he points out over and over again that it's not addiction and it's not overdose, it's actually poisoning. Right. And the um, uh, one of the Democrat people that were there kept saying, oh yeah, you know, we have to address addiction and we have to address, we have to address um, uh, overdoses and even the mother of the young of the young young person who had died from fentanyl poisoning said it's not overdose but it you know it 
uh, anyway, they try and steer the whole subject of the fentanyl coming over the border and the poisoning of Americans. They try to steer it away into people who have become addicted to drugs. And that's not what it is. And it's just, and it's a partisan thing, which is insane. You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out, if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. It's crazy. You know, the thing that I find so confusing at one time and then at another time and Trisha and I talk about this is fentanyl is killing Republicans, fentanyl is killing Democrats. Oh yeah. Fentanyl is killing independents. It's killing white people and black people and Hispanic people. It doesn't care. It's an equal opportunity poisoner. And yep. you're right that it is a poison and they are poisonings, but often it's somebody, not always, sometimes it's a person who it's a kid who's buying a pill they think's an Adderall, as we know, yeah. uh, and it turns out to have fentanyl on it, and it kills them. Uh, sometimes they're buying a benzodiazepine, they think it's a Xanax, and it's got fentanyl, and it's killing them. But other times you do have people who are addicted to opioids, who are addicted to, let's say, uh, um, prescription opioids. Those prescriptions have been cut back as doctors have finally, the pendulum goes so far in one direction, they used to give them out like candy. Yeah. Now you can't get one if you've had six surgeries. Yeah. Uh, but so people are looking for alternative ways to control their pain who have chronic pain. Uh, it's pushed people into heroin. And sometimes it pushes people who are addicts in opioids already to try fentanyl. So, you know, there's a great yeah. crossover here. Uh, I'm going down, Trisha and I are going down this September, on September the 23rd to the third annual, you know, Voices Against, you know, Lost Voices of Fentanyl. Mm. The, the group of mothers pulled together by April Babcock and others are holding their third annual rally um, on, the, on the National Mall. Uh, I didn't make it last year, the year before, and we it, other things came up this year where we marked it down in, in concrete and said, you know, we're getting there no matter what. We're, we're going down on our own, uh, paying our ways. We hope other people will find their way to Washington. We shouldn't have to gather on the National Mall. Uh, they, the mothers, uh, who have lost children, the fathers who have lost children to fentanyl shouldn't have to pay the federal government to, for the rental and all of the material for the National Mall. They should be invited into the White House. I don't care if it's Biden or Trump or whoever, to talk to them and tell them what they're going to do. Right. It's a nonpartisan issue. And as you say, it doesn't, fentanyl doesn't care your religion, doesn't care your color, doesn't care your political leaning, and it doesn't care about the political leanings of your parents. You know, and it's killing kids just, uh, you know, willy nilly throughout our country. It's scary. The, and, and I think that, uh, you know, there are a couple, one of the problems we get to on something like fentanyl um, is, and I've talked to a lot of people about it, just lay people. Sometimes it'll come up as a discussion. Some know somebody who's been poisoned by fentanyl and they know somebody who was addicted to oxy uh, and we'll have a discussion. and. There's a, a a level at which a fair number of them sort of throw their hands up and say, "It's impossible. We can't stop it. It's too much. We're 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 intercepting now. You know, five or six times as much fentanyl as we had intercepted before, enough to kill the country two times over. And we only intercept a small portion of what's coming in. So there's so much here. How can we ever stop? It? And therefore, they they almost give up. Yeah. Let's talk instead about. Uh, what the football season is going to look like. Um, and that's unfortunate because that level of, you know, apathy, sort of ap apathy, yeah, yeah. Sort of apathy caused by frustration that yep. it, the problem can't be tackled. Yep. Yep. I will tell you though, and you know this, um, there are parents who are not apathetic about it and they won't be, and they won't let it go because they've lost their kids. And when you start, messing with parents who have lost kids. You think a big black bear is scary? Yeah, you ain't seen nothing yet. And these parents are, they are, they are being heard and they're getting out there. And I appreciate you and Trisha 
backing these people up and supporting these people because where they have the passion because they've lost a loved one, loved one, you have the, you guys have the passion, but you have the facts, you have the data and it's really hard for people to argue with that. And you know, though, I will tell you that it's the parents who have us on fire, if that makes sense. It does. You just have to listen to them and talk to them. And, you know, every story is so heart wrenching, individually different. And, and you just feel like, you know, we, we finished talking to a parent. We, and we say to each other as we walk out, we just feel like going to Washington and rattling the cage of both sides of the aisle. The, we have godchildren, 12 and 14 years old, two boys. You know, we think about them often. They're, they are, you know, good, clean kids right now. You think as they get to, they're going to high school uh, soon, one of them, you know, you, you want them to be careful. I tell them every pill, everything you possibly look at could be poison. The other day, maybe two weeks or so ago, uh, Joni, I made a, a reservation on um, American Airlines to travel down to Washington in September. And the uh, person, the uh, agent who was helping me, she was really, really helpful. And uh, she said, it's a quick trip because I think we're going in for overnight. That's it. And I said, I'm going down to this uh, Lost Voices of Fentanyl to the National Mall for this rally. She had a 25 year old who was now healthy and safe, who had had um, some problems. And she got so emotional and talking. We both did, as a matter of fact, in that conversation. If American Airlines supervisors were listening to it, they probably thought, what is, what's going on there? Uh, <laughs> but it, it, there is a point at which there is this emotional level at which parents connect and anybody who has any feelings, any common sense, any heart, absolutely understands that this is one of the worst tragedies affecting uh, the country. And uh, it's, it's taking place without, you know, I, and. And again, I may criticize a politician, but I tell you, I, I criticize both sides of the aisle. I do. We have a president, though, now who didn't mention fentanyl for, you know, the first couple of years of that. If he said it a hundred times, we still might be at the same spot. I understand it might not be much better, but it would be great to have our political leaders in both parties talking about it more. They don't because they don't have a solution. Uh, yep. And I don't expect them to have a solution. I don't expect them to come up tomorrow and say, here's what we do, X, Y, and Z, and it's all over next Thursday. But let's talk about some things. Because the wrong thing to do is nothing. Absolutely. That's the wrong thing. And so they could come up with things that they could do. Maybe, what about maybe closing the border? I don't know, just a concept. I, will it still come in? Probably. Will that slow it down? I would think so. It, it It's not that there's just, as you said, one magic pill or one magic thing that's going to solve the whole thing, but do something. Take action so, somewhere. So, you know, the um, because doing nothing is not, as you just said, not just is it wrong, but it's deadly. Yeah. I mean, it, the, 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 the toll is, you know, unbelievable. It's the fentanyl. I mean, 70% of the overdose deaths every year now are fentanyl, and it's the single largest cause of death of people between the ages of 25 and 45. I have an article I just read a month ago that the number of deaths of those under 18 has gone up five times over what had been just a few years earlier. So that's a remarkable increase yep. uh, that we're talking about. And, and when you say do something, yes. So it's a combination of not just passing the legislation, but then you have to act on it. And what I, what I mean by that is, Colorado is an example. So Colorado changed its law a year and a half ago. It looks good on paper. Colorado said, we are going to um, be able to prosecute as murder individuals who deal in fentanyl at a high enough level. You have over a certain amount, you're selling fentanyl, people have died, we're gonna come after you for murder. Okay, well that, that's not gonna be the end of fentanyl dealing, but boy, I'll tell you, that's pretty serious. Since then, they've had over 600 deaths from fentanyl they brought nine cases and uh, that's it. Uh, it they they've had dozens to look at and they declined to prosecute in those so you know if you have the tools you want to use it fairly aggressively in california where we know there's a major fentanyl issue and a, a fentanyl issue on the street as well uh governor newsom's really come up with a plan another 96 million dollars uh but most of it goes to treatment which is good uh, you know and things like this but there is no real answer. Now in San Francisco, which I follow carefully because it's my 
home city. I grew up there. I went to mm. Berkeley as an undergraduate, went to Hastings at law school before I moved to New York. Uh, and uh, I follow a, somebody who's a recovered addict who's now out there fighting to, to stop the, the scourge of drugs, a uh, guy, uh, T. Wolf. He's on uh, Twitter and he, he posts the very fact that, um, you know, San Francisco police will not arrest many of the dealers of fentanyl and other drugs because they actually are Honduran uh, nationals. It's been talked about, it's been in blogs and everything else. If they were in fact arrested, it would raise a question of deportation for some who are here illegally. Since San Francisco is a sanctuary city, it's off limits. Now, when you have two policies colliding like this, you need somebody with common sense to come in and say, okay, if you wanna be a sanctuary city, great. If you wanna protect uh, foreign nationals who arrived who don't have their paperwork, fine, go for it. But if you're also protecting them when they're doing illegal things like dealing drugs, somebody's lost their mind. Yes. So th there has to be a rule here. Uh, and you know we have some of the laws are on the books and either we ignore them or they're turned upside down in this, in this crazy world. Yep, wow, wow. Well, we should yeah. have your friend on the podcast. You should get yes, he's on the podcast. Yeah, okay. he's very good. He's outspoken. And as a matter of fact, it's very interesting because he lived it. He was there. He was, yeah. it, not for just a, the luck of a few things. He would be one of the casualties. And and now he he's quite outspoken. He knows there's no single solution. Mm -hmm. And so and, and that's it. And sometimes I saw a recent debate to the extent that debates exist on Twitter in which uh, there are advocates uh, for a homelessness that say uh, we should have uh, housing first. Housing comes before drug rehab or and in some countries like Finland have done that. That's the most important thing. And he argued and said in Los Angeles where they're doing housing first in some areas, they've had overdose deaths inside the new houses. You can't just put people who have unbridled drug addictions necessarily inside without any treatment options or a path for recovery. Um, that would seem to be common sense, but people get quite exercised about those things. Yep. Yep. I, I, you are correct. Okay. So Gerald, what, what do we tell people? What do we, what do we want to tell people about this whole subject? We got to give well, them a message of I, hope somewhere. <laughs> well, I mean, there is hope because I think that it, it Famous last words, don't hold me to this, can't get much worse, so we're near the bottom. <laughs> um, yeah, the, uh, so I think that there are a number of things. I mean, first of all, it, it, to the parents out there, you just do your absolute best at reminding your children that every possible you know, drug they take that's not from a doctor and over-the-counter at a Walgreens or a, a Dwayne Reed or a CVS, is potentially poison. And and not to think of it as fentanyl, but as poison. Somebody put rat poison in it, it's going to kill you. That's the equivalent of what fentanyl is. And you may not know, the dealer who sells you the drug may not know. So the college kid who's providing the Adderall to you and you think, oh, that's great because I know that kid um, and he's been around for a while, may not know that the supplier has put fentanyl into the lot. So, you know, there's no way to go back and, and double test. And if you see kids who die accidentally of accidental overdoses, there are too many of them. You don't want to be one of those. So for parents, you just have to sort of drive that home to the extent that that's possible. And that I think is absolutely critical. Then I think what we need uh, uh, from the government leaders in our is more action. We are not going to arrest our way out of this crisis. That's clear, all right? We didn't do it on, on, on the war on drugs for all this time. So I, I can't say, oh, if we have a little bit more DEA enforcement and Colorado processes more people for murder, it'll all be over. But we do have to make that a higher cost for fentanyl dealers um, and for the suppliers. So I've talked to parents who think that the U.S. should name the cartels who are making a lot of money off of this as foreign terror organizations. Um, I think, that, yeah. yeah, and uh, if, it, it gives us, so what does that do? Somebody says, oh, that sounds great on paper. No, 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 it's not just paper. Let me tell you, I did a book on 9-11. I did a book on Saudi Arabia and the, the funding of terror organizations in radical Islam. Once they're designated a terror organization as some of these fake charities where they were funding real extremists, the U.S. has tools to go after the finances. Ah the money, the old money trail of these uh, cartels in a way they can't right now to put individuals on the list, to stop the bank accounts, to make them pariahs in the international community in terms of moving their funds around. 
Why we have not done that is because of a diplomatic standoff with Mexico that I'm not privy to, mm. but it, that should be done. Mm -hmm. um, and to the extent I've also talked to people who think that fentanyl should be declared a weapon of mass destruction. I don't actually, I know that that's an interesting idea. I'm not as enthusiastic about that yet as I am, because what I don't want to have happen is we declare fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction, and then it's replaced by a drug that we yet don't know uh, yes. down the road. You know, and we're admired in that. We should be able to go after fentanyl as we do any other poisonous opioid uh, without having to call it a, a WMD. But um, I'm, uh, I'm game for that. And we should definitely have the analog safety uh, law passed in Congress. Then the question becomes, uh, you know, what you talked about before, Joni, I think is key. This gets, this issue of fentanyl gets wrapped up too often in an issue and a debate. And I have it with people about harm reduction, about safe injection sites, everything else. That's because they're confusing fentanyl with addiction. Yep. You're absolutely right. And they are different. They, they really are. We can, de I'm all for, you know, harm reduction together with education, together with a path for somebody to be able to get off their addiction, but it's a separate issue from fentanyl. We, uh, there are, I, I know very few maintenance fentanyl addicts out there. Yep, us too. And when a child decides to try a Xanax and gets one off of social media and dies because it's fentanyl, that's not addiction. That's not overdose, that's poisoning. Right. And I do think that the laws can be updated, uh, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> state by state in terms. I mean, you know, the other day here in Florida where uh, we live, um, I think uh, Governor DeSantis, together with the legislature, it's either proposed or I think they passed it. Uh, they have the death penalties now available for um, people who rape children, child rapists. Um, and uh, that's now on the thing. Uh, the maybe you know fentanyl can be looked at as strengthening the laws we're not going to scare people away from dealing it because there's a lot of money down all the way down the line but i do think there has to be an extra penalty here yep. if you are distributing a poison you remember maybe 20 25 years ago somebody will write into you and correct it i'm sure it's longer than that i've got mm -hmm. it out but there was a great scare in america when a few people maybe five people died from tylenol poisoning there had been uh yeah, 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 yeah. tampered with yeah. with uh with uh 30 years ago with uh, uh sort of tylenol capsules yep. and put cyanide inside yep. and then some people died that's the poisoning same thing. If, if yeah same thing i will tell you we were up in arms about it right yep. because people think oh well tylenol that's something any of us could buy at the local store fentanyl is something being used by addicts and not true i keep telling yep. them and you know yeah, and, and the uh, they do understand it. They don't understand it completely. But fentanyl is its own class, and that's why it's so dangerous. Yep, you are correct. And education, 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 which is why I'm super excited that you came and talked to us today. And um, definitely send me the link to Substack, and I'll put it in the show notes. And I'll also put a graphic up for people who watch this on YouTube um, and any other places you think they should go. I think I'll also put up the um, Lost Voices of Fentanyl with the date of their rally because I'm sure that there are a lot more parents out there who are experiencing this. And um, yeah, but thank you. You know, it, fantastic. I will tell you, I mean, I remember just watching and listening to what um, the Lost Voices of Fentanyl, April Babcock and that had to go through, like when they originally got them all, they had to go through the bureaucracy of figuring out how to do it. Who do you contact? How do you rent a space? Where do you get this? I'm looking at all of this effort spent on this and they are determined to do it and have their voices heard. But I'm thinking to myself, they shouldn't have to go through that. The, it, it, yeah, and, and it's one of the things that just gets us up and furious about it. Uh, and I just think that, you know, and us being mad about it isn't gonna make a difference on the final result, but I'm hoping that more journalists at the major mainstream outlets uh, we'll cover it not as part of the overall addiction story, the, but as its own deadly separate chapter um, to what is what I view 
the natural outcome of uh, the uh, drug companies addicting so many people to an excessive amount of prescription opioid painkillers for reasons for which they should not have been prescribed. That also has created the, the, the fertile groundwork uh, and fertilizer for the, uh, for the fentanyl epidemic. I completely agree. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you to you Thank and your you, lovely Karen. wife who's not on camera Thank because you, you guys Thanks. continue to you know, fight the fight and really confront the evil that is there um, on this subject. And we so respect you both and appreciate you both. Um, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to one day being on the show and we could say together, whatever happened to fentanyl? Remember when that was such a, <laughs> that would be great. Please in our lifetime, please God. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening today. I want to repeat something that Gerald said, and that is the Lost Voices of Fentanyl. And that website is lvof.org. And they're having a rally in Washington, D.C. on September 23rd. And if you or someone you know has been affected by this whole fentanyl poisoning situation, then you might want to go and you might want to spread the word. And I think that... Um, the politicians in Washington, and I don't care whether they're Republicans or Democrats, they need to um, get their heads from where the sun doesn't shine, and they need to start doing something about the situation with fentanyl. And I'm sorry if it's going to step on political toes to perhaps close the border, but if that's what's needed, then that's what should be done. So thank you for listening today. We'll be back again with another interview. You have been listening to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information, reach out to us on Facebook or go to www.theaddictionpodcast.com. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com.